For a case of hip pain, using our mnemonic old cards will note the onset, or when did your pain start? Did it come on suddenly, or was it more gradual? And do you remember what you were doing at the time? For the location, we'll ask our patient to point with one finger. As we'll see below, true hip joint pathology involving the joint is going to be anterior across the groin. If it's posterior or lateral, it's usually going to be pointing to something else. For the duration, we want to know if your pain has been constant since it started or if it's more intermittent. If that's the case, we like to note the frequency. That is, how long does an episode of your pain last for and how many episodes have you been having per day or per week? Next, we'll note the progression. Does your pain appear to be occurring more frequently or more severely? Or if there has been no progression, we'll also state that in our patient note to show we've asked. To help characterize the pain, we like some descriptors, sharp or dull among others. And since this can involve the nerves, we'll ask about any numbness, tingling, or motor weakness, aggravating and alleviating factors, radiation, treatments tried, and severity on a scale of 1 to 10. And again, if there are no aggravating and alleviating factors or radiation, we'll also want to state that in our patient note to show we've asked. We'll break down our case of hip pain into traumatic and atraumatic causes. For all cases, let's order a CBC, serum electrolytes, an x-ray of the right or left hip, a DEXA scan, serum, calcium and vitamin D, and if we find any neuropathy as we'll see above, a nerve conduction study and an electromyogram. In a hip dislocation, our supporting points will include hip pain, and since it's involving the actual hip joint, it will be anterior or across the groin. The onset will be sudden after a fall or trauma, and it will be aggravated by movements, and as we'll see in our physical exam coming up, we'll note a decreased range of motion. In a hip or femur fracture, we'll find hip pain, and again, it's going to be anterior or across the groin. The onset, too, will be sudden after a fall or trauma, and since the fracture can involve the underlying nerve, we can't find a neuropathy, or numbness, tingling, or motor weakness. It will be aggravated by movement, and we'll find limited relief by conservative management because the underlying fracture hasn't been fixed, and we'll also see a decreased range of motion in our physical exam. In osteoarthritis, or degenerative joint disease, DJD, we'll find hip pain, and again, involving the joint, it's going to be anterior or across the groin. The onset now is going to be more gradual, but progressively worsening. It will be characterized as dull or achy, and it will be aggravated with use, standing or using the stairs, and alleviated with rest. Classically, it's seen in an older patient group, and as we'll see with any lower extremity, added weight will increase the risk. In lumbar radiculopathy, for example, a lateral disc herniation narrowing the nerve foramen, we'll find hip pain, and now it's going to be posterior if it's involving the S1 nerve root, or it could be lateral if it's involving the L4 or L5 nerve roots. We'll also have now a low back pain and a radiculopathy, or a unilateral radiating pain, numbness, tingling, or motor weakness down the hip. And it will be aggravated by walking or movement and alleviated by sitting forward. And we can find lower motor nerve or foramina symptoms, including delayed deep tendon reflexes when we check our patella or Achilles. Also, a positive Faber test, also known as a Patrick's or figure four, reproducing posterior if it's the S1 nerve root or a lateral if the L4, L5 nerve root. And we'll add to our workup an x ray of the lumbar spine and an MRI of the lumbar spine. In greater trochanteric pain syndrome, formerly known as trochanteric or hip bursitis, the pathology was found to involve more of the gluteal tendons, similar to a rotator cuff tear involves rotator cuff muscles. So the name was changed. Now we're going to find a hip pain and it's going to be more lateral. It will be aggravated with activity, standing or stairs, and alleviated with conservative management, PT, ICE, or NSAIDs. And again, as we see in the lower extremities, obesity will be a risk factor due to the added weight. And we'll find a positive Faber test, also known as a, as a Patrix, or figure four, reproducing now lateral pain. And we'll order an ultrasound of the right or left hip and an MRI of the right or left hip. In rheumatoid arthritis, we'll see hip pain, and it will be aggravated in the morning. High yield, morning stiffness. It will be alleviated with use and we'll find additional bilateral small joint arthritis in the wrists or fingers. We could also note systemic symptoms in our review of symptoms, including fatigue, fever, or weight loss. We'll also find a positive family history. We'll order an ESR CRP, rheumatoid factor, and anti CCP antibodies. In systemic lupus erythematosus, we'll find a hip pain with a mal or rash and oral ulcers. Our patient can also be complaining of photosensitivity and rainouts or blue fingers in the cold or times of stress. And we'll also find systemic symptoms in our review of symptoms, including fatigue, 
fever, or weight loss. And we can note a history of abortions in our OB or gyne history. We'll order an ESR CRP, an ANA, anti-double-stranded DNA antibodies, and anti-Smith antibodies. In crystal arthritis, we'll see a hip pain, and now in our inspection and palpation, we'll note erythema, warmth, and swelling. In gout, we'll find podagra, or at the big toe, and tophi, or crystal deposits in the ear or behind the Achilles. We could also see a history of heavy alcohol use or diuretic. And pseudogout is found in an older patient group, and we can note a history of triggers, such as surgeries or medical illnesses. We'll order ESR CRP, arthrocentesis for gram stain culture microscopy, and a serum uric acid level. And finally, in septic arthritis, we'll see a hip pain, and again, in our inspection and palpation, we'll find fever, erythema, warmth, and swelling. In the gonococcal form, classically, it's going to be a female because they're asymptomatic gonococcal carriers with a characteristic pustular rash and a history of STDs or multiple sexual partners. And in the non-gonococcal staph aureus or strep, we'll find a history of skin traumas, abrasions or cuts, diabetes or IV drug use. And we'll add here blood cultures. So I walk into the room, sanitize my hand. I don't want to touch patient until my hands are fully dry. Of course, I would avoid taking a history of, so I know that he has pain in the right hip, and that's what I'm going to assess. Now, you want to do both, both hip joints, but in the interest of time, I'm going to demonstrate on just one hip joint. So, hello, Mr. Uh, doctor, Mr. <laughs> Which one is better for you? Uh, so I'm going to be checking out your, um, your hip joint, okay? Thank you. If you hurt at any point, let me know, um, let me know okay? I know. Yes. I'll, I'll, I'll be careful. All right. So I'm looking at the joints. Normally the patient will be in a gown, but we don't have one now, so you know we're gonna have to make do. So I'm gonna look. I'm checking for any lesions, no visible lesions to me, no redness, no swellings. Uh, okay, no scars, no nothing. All right. So I'm gonna palpate. Let me know when you feel pain, okay? Yes, a little bit of pain there. Okay, sorry. Um, all around, okay. Just a little bit of pain. All right. So, inspection, palpation done. Time for range of motion. Again, because with every joint, you want to do joint above, joint below. The hip is the most proximal of the lower extremity, so I can only do the joint below. So, I'm going to have you stand up. There are ways you can do this. You can do this with a patient laying down. Personally, I tend to prefer the patient standing up. And I support the patient like this and just demonstrate to do what I do. Can you flex your hip? I have some pain when I bring it. Okay, I'm sorry. Can you extend your hip? Yeah, some pain as well. Okay, I'm sorry. Can you abduct? Just do this. Can you, ab excuse me, abduct <laughs> like this? Okay, this is adduction. Okay, all right. So I've checked the range of motion of the hip. Now, for economy of movement and of time, since the patient is already standing, I like to see his gait because I'm going to check it anyways. So please, can you walk all the way there? Okay, now walk back to me. Okay, thank you very much. So, patient has a normal gait, is non shuffling. So, I'm going to ask him to sit down. Okay, thank you. And I can do the range of motion of the knee as well. Now, you can have the patient lay down, you can have them sit down. For the interest of this, since the camera is right here, I'm just going to do it while he's sitting down. So, can you extend your knee? Bring it right back. Any pain or difficulty doing that? No? no? Okay, thank you very much. Now I'm going to have him lay down. Now to demonstrate with a patient laying down. I want to check a passive range of motion. So I'm just going to lift it up. You feel any pain? A little bit. Okay. What about now? Yes, a little bit. Okay, so you can see the, knees are fl the knee is flexed, and I'm ad adducting. This checks for internal rotation of the hip joint. 
this is external rotation of the hip joint. I don't feel any stiffness, but he feels some pain when I do that. All right, so that's completed the range of motion of the passive range of motion of the hip joint. So I've done inspection, I've done palpation, I've done range of motion, hip and the joints below. So again, according to the algorithm, I'm supposed to do muscle strength next. To do that, I'm going to have him try to uh, flex his hip against my resistance. Can you do that on just your right? Flex against resistance, okay. Flex on your left. Okay, so as you can see, the um, muscle strength on the left hip is much stronger than the right. I'll give the right about a 4 out of 5 and the left about a 5 out of 5. I'm going to do the sensations and reflexes. So, again, this is what I have to represent, a reflex hammer, and I can use it to check for sensations. Can you close your eyes, please? You feel that? Yes. You feel that? Yes. Sharp or soft? Sharp. Same on both sides? Yes. You feel that? Yes. You feel that? Yes. Sharp or soft? Sharp. Same on both sides? Yes. You feel that? Yes. You feel that? Yes. Sharp or soft? Sharp. Same on both sides? Yes. You feel this? Yes. You feel this? Yes. Sharp or soft? Soft. Same on both sides? Yes. Okay. So that is sensation taken care of. So, I can go ahead and just have him relax here and check for reflexes, the patella reflex. I, so, I have isolated the patella right here and the patella tendon, okay? And I'm going to do, <coughs> tap on this. So, I'm going to have him relax his leg. And I can also do this with patient sitting down, okay? Yes. Two plus. Okay, time for the pulses. You want to check the popliteal pulse, the um, posterior tibial, and the dorsalis pedis. Don't expect all the time to get the popliteal pulse. So you can check. I don't feel it. You relax your leg. I don't feel it. Again, it's perfectly fine if you don't feel it. And then I'm, I'm going to check the, um, the dorsalis pedis just behind the medial malleolus. Yes, I feel that. Okay, same on both sides. And the posterior tibial and the dorsalis pedis. You want to target the place between the a big toe and the second toe just almost the space in between. I feel that. And I feel it here. Okay. So that is the pulses being checked in this patient. So I've gone through the algorithm of both. Inspection, palpation, range of motion, muscle strength, sensation, reflexes, and pulses. And then I'm going to have the patient sits back down. Thank you. Okay. So that ends the physical examination of the hip. So do you have any questions for me? Yes, doctor. Do you think I'll be able to use my hip like I did before or I'll always have this pain? Yeah, I understand the concern that you might always have this pain. So after the physical examination, um, it looks that there might be a tendon inflammation around the area. So I'm going to do a couple of tests. Of course, I'm going to do a twin blood test. And I might do an MRI there to see, okay? And also an x-ray to see if I can isolate any fracture or anything like that. But um, yes, you should be able to use your, um, maintain full use of your limb. And what is the MRI, I think you said? Okay, um, it's basically a machine where we're going to put you in and have uh, almost like makes use of magnetic waves to see what's going okay. on. It's very good at isolating, you know, soft tissue. Okay, okay if there's a muscle tear, we're going to, is, MRI is oh, going to pick see. it up. Okay, thank okay? you. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. And that ends the exam.